Hello and welcome back to another video on my channel. Uh, sorry if you hear the fan of my computer in the background. Um, for some reason it's having quite a hard time and uh, I kind of need to record this video uh, promptly so uh, you're going to have to bear with unfortunately. Now today I will be doing part two of a previous video about the, uh, the House of Orsini and today I will be looking at their rival house, the House of Colonna and also uh, the House of Colonna's kind of uh, ancestor house, which was the House of Tusculum. Uh, now, as you can see, they um, kind of run simultaneously to the Orsini. The Orsini were slightly older than uh, the Counts of Tusculum, uh, but both houses claim lineage from uh, Julius Caesar and the Julio-Claudians. Uh, however, the House of Tusculum uh, was far more prominent in uh, kind of the maybe uh, 10th century into the 11th century, I would say. Uh, and they more or less ruled Rome as a family uh, for about 200 years until they split off into two families. Uh, now, technically I will be covering three families as well, uh, but we'll just see how this goes. Now, the first period that I will cover is uh, that of the House of Tusculum. Now Matt uh, from Useful Charts made a very good video of this uh, where he covered Marozia and the various popes. Uh, so I recommend that you check that out and I will uh, put a link in the description to that video. Uh, but I will also give my own little um, introduction I guess uh, to this. So. Uh, Theodora and her husband Theophylact were uh, Byzantine Greek settlers to Naples and they eventually moved to Rome and Theophylact was made Count of Tusculum. Uh, now Tusculum was a city nearby Rome, uh, you know, it was a Roman city actually uh, and it was quite prominent in its day. Uh, now Theophylact was kind of the power behind the papacy uh, for several decades. However, many people think that it was actually his wife, Theodora, who was a senatrix, uh, who really controlled uh, Theophylact and hence controlled the papacy. Uh, now, this is because she was the mistress to a pope, uh, John X, and she also probably instated her daughter's, uh, mis uh, well, her daughter's uh, lover as the pope as well. Now, that lover was a man named Sergius, uh, and she probably helped get Sergius uh, into uh, power. Uh, and after Sergius died, there was another pope. And then uh, there was John X, who was uh, Theodora's lover. And it's thought that uh, Theodora probably uh, bribed a lot of people and got him into power. Uh, now, Theodora and Theophylact obviously uh, died. Uh, but their legacy was really with their two daughters, particularly Marozia, who I've nicknamed the Pope Maker. Uh, now, why is this? Well, she more or less controlled the papacy, like I say, uh, similar to her mother, uh, and she is often regarded as the closest Rome has ever been to having a female pope. Indeed, this is an image of a female pope called uh, Pope Joan, and that was a, a legend in the medieval period about uh, a pope who was a female and she actually gave birth during mass and that's what blew her cover. Uh, but people think that maybe uh, that myth was based off Marozia. Uh, so Marozia um, had a lover, uh, like I say, Sergius, who was a pope, and she was also uh, the mother of a pope uh, called uh, John. Now she made a series of uh, important marriages first one was to Alberic, the Duke of Spoleto, and the Duchy of Spoleto was the most important duchy uh, in Italy at that time, so, you know, that was a very good marriage for her. She then married Guy, who was the brother of the King of Italy, and after Guy died, he, uh, she, she married uh, Hugh, who was on his way to being made um, the Holy Roman Emperor, so Marozia could have been the Empress. However, her son, Alberic, who was now the new Duke of Spoleto, uh, basically had a diplomatic incident with uh, Hugh at the uh, wedding feast. And uh, basically, Alberic stormed out, he incited a uh, rebellion in Rome, and Alberic 
made uh, Hugh basically flee. Uh, and Hugh would die uh, quite soon after. Uh, but Alberic managed to capture his mother and his uh, half-brother, John, and uh, he made them both prisoners. And so Alberic basically took his mother's, uh, his mother's space as uh, the power behind the throne. Now, Alberic married the daughter of Hugh, funnily enough, and it's through this uh, link that the family can trace their lineage all the way back to Charlemagne and Pepin, who, uh, and Pepin uh, was in the other video, uh, he basically helped found the Papal States with uh, the Orsini Pope Stephen II. Okay, uh, so on Alberic's deathbed, he made the Curia of Rome um, basically elect his uh, son, uh, Octavian, as uh, Pope John XII after his death. And the Curia, who were really uh, under Alberic's sway by that point, obliged. And so uh, John was made the Pope. Now, he was one of the worst popes in papal history. Uh, he had many orgies in uh, the papal throne, uh, sorry, the papal palace. Uh, he was known to have had many mistresses, one of whom was called Joan. Uh, and that's also where they think the um, Pope myth about the uh, Pope Joan might have come from. And uh, he crowned the uh, King of uh, Germany, Otto III. Uh, so he was pretty uh, important, although he allegedly died uh, during sex when uh, one of the men who he was uh, basically stealing his wife from, so he was having an affair with this lady, uh, this guy who was the lady's husband came in and threw him out of the window, or so the tale goes. Now, his nephew was uh, the Count of Tusculum, and he married a distant cousin called Marozia. And uh, to trace Marozia back, we go back to uh, Theodora, her mother, and then Theodora, Theodora's mother, who was the sister of Marozia. And this Theodora married uh, Crescentius, who was a patrician, or an important Roman at the time. And uh, their son was also a pope, Pope John XIII, nicknamed the Good, who was the um, successor to John the Twelfth, and uh, John the Thirteenth uh, had a brother called Crescentius the Elder, who also had um, a pope as his son, and his um, son Crescentius the Younger was actually executed in a coup. But he was um, an important patrician as well, and he has descendants living to this day. Anyway, back to uh, these three brothers. Now, Benedict was made Pope in 1012, and he fought the Saracens uh, near Sardinia. Now, after he died, uh, the papacy went to his brother directly, uh, and his name was John the uh, 20... Sorry, uh, John the 19th, should I say. Uh, now, again, he was an important Pope. He ruled uh, for uh, about eight years, and then it went. the papacy went directly to his nephew, Benedict the 9th, who is the most infamous pope in history, uh, by my rating at least. Uh, and Benedict was pope three times. Uh, the first time he was about age 12, they think, uh, and he basically sold the papacy to a distant uh, relative. Uh, then he decided he wanted it back, so he uh, reclaimed the throne, and then he was exiled by uh, a mob of Romans, and uh, he was ousted from the city, but then reclaimed the papacy uh, with the power of his family's army, because obviously they were very wealthy and were also counts, so they could levy armies. Uh, and he was made pope again, but then he was deposed by the Holy Roman Emperor at the Council of Sutri, because basically uh, they all thought, well, you know, why is this family getting up to so much mischief? Uh, really, they should stop. Uh, so... After Benedict's uh, fall, uh, there was one more um, anti-pope, but then the family split in two. Now, the family I will be mostly covering today is the House of Colonna. However, I feel like I should probably mention the House of uh, Conti as well, because they were immediately quite important. Uh, they had several popes, but then uh, they fell from uh, prominence for about a thousand years. Uh, well, maybe less than that, but... Uh, they were certainly a bit less uh, prominent. So I'll talk about these guys first. Um, they were the uh, Counts of Segni, 
and again near uh, Rome. There was also a line of Counts of Tusculum, which I haven't covered just because they faded from importance. Now the first Conti Pope was uh, Innocent III, who uh, incited the uh, Fourth Crusade uh, and massacred many, many, many Christians in the uh, the Cathar um, Crusades as well. Uh, so he was quite a bad Pope. But alternatively, he also instated uh, St. Francis of Assisi as, uh, you know, basically he gave them the power to start a religious order. And um, he also, um, well, sorry, his successor instated uh, St. Uh, Dominic. So he did some very bad things and some very good things for the Catholic Church. So a very uh, divisive character. And uh, I think you can make your own judgments about him. Uh, personally, I think he was probably... Um, a little bit on the crazy side, but maybe had good intentions. But like I say, uh, you can draw your own conclusions. Uh, now, then there was uh, Celestine. Oh, sorry, no, he, um, Innocent III, uh, succeeded Celestine. Then there was another pope for uh, about 11 years. And then it went to Innocent's first cousin, who was called Gregory. Uh, and like I say, uh, Gregory instated the Dominicans, and then his nephew was made Pope, uh, and then his um, great-nephew, who wasn't a Conti but related to the Conti, was Boniface VIII, who Dante puts uh, in one of the worst circles of hell because uh, he was a very evil man. He, uh, he killed a monk who was made Pope for basically power-thirsty reasons, so an awful guy. Uh, and uh, the family does continue on, uh, and we will see them again uh, in a bit, but for now... Uh, you can ignore them. Now, the other person uh, who made the family was Gregory, and this was the House of Colonna, also known as the Schiari. Um, and they were the rivals of the Orsini, like I mentioned. Uh, there were actually a few marriages in between the families, uh, and like the Orsini, every generation might have had uh, the odd cardinal or, or even two. Then we get to Giacomo Schiara Colonna, hence the Schiari, and he Schiard the Pope, da <laughs> um, No, he hit the Pope, uh, basically, in uh, a burst of anger. Uh, I think it was Boniface VIII. And um, for this, he was basically excommunicated and imprisoned and died in obscurity. Uh, but he was quite famous for doing that, uh, Giacomo Schiara Colonna. Uh, and then we get to uh, Martin V, who was the next uh, colonna pope. Now, despite the colonna family's importance, they only really had one pope, although I suppose you could say they had many other popes from the uh, House of Tusculum. But from the House of uh, Colonna proper, there was only one pope, and that was Martin V. Now, he was made uh, pope after um, the Avignon crisis, and the Western Schism, where there were um, two popes and at some point even three popes on the throne. Uh, so, yeah, he was an important pope. He basically unified the church uh, and was, an sorry, was a very important guy. Um, now, he, uh, like all men, died, and uh, his family um, eventually faded from prominence. However, he was able to secure the family's wealth by instating uh, some of his sons as, oh, sorry, not some of his sons, some of his nephews as cardinals, uh, and some of uh, his other nephews as important lords. And now one of those nephews who was made a cardinal was Prospero Colonna, uh, and he um, was basically in many, many conclaves. A conclave was basically the election for Pope, and um, as was common in the Renaissance period, uh, you could expect to get a few bribes if you were a cardinal uh, who was voting in the conclave because basically people would have political candidates that they wanted to be made pope. Uh, and yeah, it was a bit messed up and uh, really it shouldn't have happened, but it did, unfortunately. Uh, so yeah, um, it's unfortunate that that happened, but the family did get some great wealth from that. Uh, now next... We have uh, the two brothers, or oh, sorry, two cousins, Prospero and Fabrizio. Uh, now, this guy uh, and this guy were both important mercenaries. Now, uh, you should know what a mercenary is, but if you don't know, basically it was um, a soldier who had an army and was paid. 
uh, to fight in wars rather than being uh, conscripted or um, the general for a state. So basically, you would pay for these guys to fight for you. And the reason why they were so important was because Italy at the time uh, was a collection of many states. There wasn't one big kingdom of Italy uh, like there is today. Well, I suppose it's not a kingdom, but uh, well, sorry about that. Um, it wasn't a uh, kingdom, uh, but rather many different uh, states. And as a consequence, they couldn't levy huge armies. So they would need to rely on uh, condottieri uh, armies or mercenary armies to uh, basically fight their battles for them. And the colonna distinguished themselves as important condottieri. Uh, so the first was Fabrizio. Uh, let me just sift through my notes. Uh, I printed off quite a few, uh, actually. Uh, let me just see. Okay, so um, Prospero was, uh, sorry, Fabrizio was um, condottieri. He served in the Italian wars uh, on the peninsula. Uh, especially the Battle of Carignolo, and uh, he, yeah, he was made Duke of Pagliano, which is the title that the family still has today. He fought with his um, cousin, Prospero, who uh, was the Duke of Trito. Now, he gained this title from um, the Battle of Carignolo, sorry, uh, where am I? Uh, yeah, uh, he uh, gained this title from the Battle of Garignolo, Garigliano, sorry, uh, it's quite hard to pronounce some of the Italian words. Um, and uh, Trito was the town near that uh, battle site, so he was made uh, Duke of Trito. And his son was also, uh, I think he was the Viceroy of Naples, uh, Vespasiano. Uh, but Prospero was the Duke of Trito, as was his son. Uh, now there was also uh, Pompeiano, uh, sorry, Pompeo. My pronunciation is off the walls today, I really apologise. Uh, now, he was an important cardinal, he was the Archbishop of Monreale, uh, and was in several conclaves. Uh, he was eventually made Viceroy of Naples, like his cousin uh, Vespasiano, uh, but then died uh, about two years into being the Viceroy. And Mark Antonio I was made Lord of Pagliano, uh, and again was a mercenary in the Italian wars. Okay, now we get onto the most famous of the colonna, in my opinion, Prince Mark Antonio, who was the Duke of Tigliacoso and the Prince of Pagliano. And now this was around the time when the um, Orsini and colonna were forcibly reconciled by the Pope, because uh, throughout the Renaissance they had basically been fighting back and forth. Uh, often the mercenary armies weren't led by uh, the prospects of money, but rather uh, defeating the Orsini faction, uh, and they uh, also had many mercenary armies. Uh, so the Pope basically forcibly made them friends again, um, you know, which is the Catholic thing to do. Um, you know, it's not very Christ-like to have uh, such bloodthirsty feuds. Um, now, Mark Antonio was a patrician in Rome, um, and he eventually served with the Spanish. Uh, and his most famous accomplishment was fighting at the Battle of Lepanto, uh, which saw the Turks, um, who were very quickly expanding into Europe, uh, halted, and it meant that the Holy League, led by Spain, um, could basically live for another day, and eventually the uh, Holy League would win other victories. But Mark Antonio led the um, Papal fleet uh, to the battle, and for that he was made um, Duke of Tigliacoso and Prince Duke of Pagliano. Um, the distinction being his grandfather and father were just the Dukes of Pagliano, but he was the Prince Duke of Pagliano. He was also made a Viceroy of Sicily a bit before uh, Lepanto, which seems to be quite a common title within the family, although it wasn't um, hereditary, it was just a coincidence, but the family were close allies to Spain. Uh, now, Mark Antonio had one son called Ascanio, named after his grandfather, uh, who was the Bishop of Palestrina, uh, and he was uh, basically big into learning, uh, art collecting, etc., so uh, an important guy. By the way, I think I've got his dates a bit mixed up here. Um, yeah, uh, I apologise for that, that's a, a typo. Now, his... Uh, nephew actually became the next Prince Duke of Pagliano after Mark Antonio, 
Uh, this guy was called Marc Antonio III. Uh, now that was because um, this guy's father had died before him. Um, now the uh, family from this point on were known as the Prince Dukes of Pagliano. I put the Dukes of Pagliano for the sake of space, but be aware that they were the Prince Dukes of Pagliano. Uh, now, then it went to Mark Antonio IV, and then to Filippo, who was a Spanish diplomat. And then there was a period where there were several claimants to the uh, dukedom, or the duchy. Uh, so, Federico and Girolamo, and Girolamo, uh, sorry, Girolamo was a cardinal, basically disputed each other's claims, and both fought to the nail for the uh, dukedom. However, um, their sort of middle brother, Marc Antonio, was the duke in their stead while they were fighting. Uh, now, eventually he died and his brother, Girolamo, eventually became the Prince Duke of Pagliano. But obviously he was a cardinal and so couldn't have children, so it went to his uh, nephew, Lorenzo. Now, I would quickly like to mention uh, this link to the papacy again. Uh, Urban VIII uh, was related to them, um, as you can see there, through Anna Colonna. Uh, now, Lorenzo himself was an important diplomat who distinguished himself uh, in the service of the papacy. And uh, he also married one of the uh, relatives, I think one of the nieces, uh, of Cardinal uh, Marzin uh, of, uh, of France, who was one of the kind of uh, top dogs in the reign of Louis the uh, 13th and maybe even early into the reign of Louis the 14th um, so that's an interesting link then there was Filippo and Fabrizio now by this point uh, the dukedom was really just a title um, they didn't really hold many lands although they were still prominent in the city of Rome and uh, you go through these different dukes and eventually we get uh, the family today now, I'd quickly like to mention that, despite the fact that they don't really hold any more lands, uh, they are still members of the Black Nobility, uh, which is a an exclusive uh, privilege hold, held for the uh, most important uh, noble houses in Rome, such as the Orsini and Colonna. Uh, and they were also the hereditary prince assistants to the papal throne, although that title was eventually lost, and I don't think they are to this day. Um, I would quickly like to mention the uh, House of Conti as well, because eventually they were made the Dukes of Poly. Uh, and this guy, Torquato, was an important uh, field marshal in the uh, Thirty Years' War. Uh, and his brother, Carlo, was the father of Pope Innocent XIII, who was the predecessor to Benedict XIII, who I covered in my last video on the Orsini. Uh, and there were a few more Dukes of Poly, uh, but they married into each other, so that's a good link there. Anyway, the current family is uh, led by this guy, Marc Antonio VIII, the Prince Duke of Pagliano, and he has been that since 1987. He has a son called Giovanni, and uh, he is the heir apparent. His brother uh, also represents the family, he is called Prospero, and he is the Prince of Avella, and he has held that title since 1987 as well. And his son is named Filippo. Uh, now, quickly, I would just like to mention uh, Domenico Crescenzi, who is the Duke of Fiano. And he is the descendant of Crescenzius the Younger. Uh, and that's basically the head of the House of Crescenzi. Uh, so, I hope you have enjoyed this video today. Um, it's been really fun to uh, make. I made this tree a while back, but uh, I haven't got around to scripting the video or anything. Uh, so thank you for watching, have a great day, and uh, I'll see you later. Goodbye.